Welcome to an episode of the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. We have Dr. Kyle Pfaffenbach from Eastern Oregon University with us. Uh, we also have Santa Cruz Bicycles Key in Swenson, uh, sponsored by Pharos, a uh, cool insurance company that's really getting into cycling and supporting cyclists and athletes, which is really great. And Rafa and Maxis and Rock Shocks and all those other brands too. Uh, we have the students. We have Mr. Miyagi and Daniel San here with us today, which is pretty sweet uh, because Keegan uh, and Kyle have worked together now for some time. Kyle, it's good to have you back on. We were just talking before we hit record. We were just talking about Keegan's training camp. Uh, he's in the middle of it for Unbound right now, getting prepped. And first of all, Keegan, what sort of hours are we are we talking about that you've been doing for the past couple weeks here? <laughs> Yeah, I don't quite know off the top of my head, uh, but close to you know, 35, 40 hours last couple of weeks. So just uh, stacking the and volume. Long days. Per week. Per week. Yeah. Per week. <laughs> if you can't see, uh, Kyle's uh, got a face of, yeah, he's incredulous. Kyle, how many athletes do you have uh, that train at that sort of, now granted, this isn't like Keegan, this isn't an everyday sort of thing, or actually we don't have to tell people that maybe mm-hmm. it is an everyday thing. Maybe these are light, maybe this You're is all around. light work. But um. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No recovery weeks. Right. But Kyle, how many of your athletes do you have that train like this in terms of volume? I don't think anyone trains with that. Just volume. It's different because in, in runners, I think about it in terms of touches. So it's interesting because like the, the runners I work with are middle distance runners. And so they do get up there to some pretty nice mileage. It's, it's really variable. It's just like based on what the person responds to. You know, one of the things we were just talking about was how it's amazing that Keegan's body can handle that type of volume. And it's very cool because like you have to figure out what, what you're responding to. Like, so the, the runners I work with, for example, they'll, they'll range from some of them. 40 miles a week and some are like closer to 120. I mean, that's a huge difference. And it's not just based on their event either. It's based on how their body responds to the different type of work. I also think about it in terms of touches and I don't know what that would be like for cyclists because we, yeah, what you know, mean? there's like, so, so drills, weight room, running, uh, specific types of work. Uh, like if, if you're doing, hill repeats or you're doing light running or you're doing those sorts of things so like everything is load um and and i think that's really important for people to like think about even like the mental stress that you're under is cognitive load the physical training you're under is is training load the stuff you're doing in the weight room is load the stuff you're doing on the bike is load and like everything is load and so that's what makes up your total volume and your capacity to kind of handle certain amounts of volume uh, is usually kind of set. It's not, uh, I shouldn't say that. You you can build into how you respond to higher volume, but like Keegan's like a unicorn in terms of uh, that amount of volume that he gets a response from. It doesn't, it doesn't break him. That's the yeah. cool part. Do you have thoughts on that, Keegan, before I jump into some nutrition questions about this? I mean... Like working into such big volume like this? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely... I mean, for me, it's just been... You know, Kyle said it doesn't really work for everyone. It's kind of uh, like we've just been, you know, slowly experimenting different things the last few years and kind of finding what works. Um, and like kind of... And also there's a the timing, right? Like you don't want to do... You can't do this... You couldn't do this much volume like too close to the race. But you don't want to do it too far out. It's just a matter of like finding the timing that works. It works ideal. Uh, yeah, so it's just been a, sometimes you're kind of guessing and sometimes it's your educated guessing and uh, eventually you kind of put the pieces together as to, to what works. But it doesn't mean, you know, it doesn't work for everyone. And um, like Sophia is doing completely different training than what I'm doing for Unbound. You know, like she, her longest ride will be, I think she has one six hour ride, um, but just a lot more intensity and just different structure. Um, so it's, yeah, it's kind of interesting to see how, how different the training is between the two of us and, yeah, you know, obviously it worked. She's done it the last couple of years and it's it's worked for her there as well. So it's um yeah. I don't know, just it's kinda of interesting to see. But. Yeah. It's, it's cool. Like, the I remember having some of these conversations with Keegan when he when you transitioned from XEO um to to more gravel stuff, and it was more of an experiment. Like hey, when we do when when uh you and 
your coach were, would start doing bigger stuff, you just like kept responding. And it was like, well, let's find out where that kind of ceiling is on this a little bit. Mm-hmm. And and it's like, doesn't seem to be reached. <laughs> which is, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Keep pushing, so the <laughs> comment I made when he was describing his hours was like, I can't believe your body responds to that. Or it's amazing that your body responds yeah. to that. Most of the time, the uh, person would be overtrained. Yeah. Um, yeah, Kyle, it's cool from, how different. Yeah, go ahead. From a nutrition perspective, let's say you have your athlete that tells you, I was training four hours a week and I forgot to tell you, but for the last 12 weeks, I've been training 14 hours a week. Uh, yeah. <laughs> from the nutritionist perspective, <laughs> right? And from dietitian and then really from the sports nutrition side of things. Like sure. what sort of questions are you asking them and what sort of things do you want to make sure they're doing? For me, I want to be careful about... Uh, making assumptions based on what is sort of conventional understanding about how they're responding. So I would ask, like, how are you responding? What's your body feel like? How's your sleep? Those are kind of the things that I would try and figure out before I just started saying, like, well, how have you changed nutritionally? How have you eaten it? Like, what's been those sorts of things? Because you really have to, like, find out what the efficiency is of the person, what the progression has been, um, what the goals are, how this is settling in and things like that. Our bodies are super adaptable, but they have a different ability and a different kind of propensity to adapt depending on the stimulus that you're applying. So when you change that stimulus kind of have to see how your body responds to it and then make an evaluation as to whether you want to continue down that road or not and so it's it's really looking at that response um that is is what's important before you start saying well you need to be getting this you need to be getting that that sort of thing i mean the one thing we've talked about in previous episodes that just doesn't change is the fat intake and carbohydrate or protein intake. So the protein intake is really, really important. The fat, when you're doing that type of volume, it gets really hard to eat enough calories with just carbohydrate. So you have to increase your fat intake a little bit or you're just going to be too hungry. I would check in. How's your hunger signal? How's your weight? How's your response? How's your sleep? How's your motivation? And then from there, the next step would be what's been your approach on the bike for eating? What's been your approach off the bike? How, are you waking up hungry? All these different things and kind of go from there. Yeah, that's, that's I think, how I would bring it in. Is that on the fat side of things? I mean, that you're... Your, your body's not just a furnace when you're pedaling the bike and you're doing a lot of volume. When you increase volume like that, it's also, it's, it's burning more calories in yeah. a, in a quote, like nascent form when you're not actually putting out output on the bike and that's predominantly going to be coming from fat. So that's why you need to supplement that. Yeah. In the sense of like, just uh, if, if you're on the bike for eight hours, uh, one, you, you have a basal metabolic rate that just is like the energy that's required for your body to stay alive and do its thing. And we typically define that as if you were to lay in bed awake all day for 24 hours. So you're conscious, you're not in a sleep state. That's your resting metabolic rate is what we call it. You know, there's calculators that do that. And, and it depends on your age and your body mass and your muscle mass and genetics and a bunch of different things. So. It's best if you can get that like measured, you know, if we have an idea of what that is. But if they're listening to their hunger signals and things like that, mo- most people intuitively can kind of figure out like, oh, yeah, I need 2,000 calories or 1,500 calories or 2,500 calories or whatever. And then on top of that, then you add in your KJ on the bike. And, and that's going to be a relationship between the work output and the heart rate and those types of things. And then you sort of the the x factor like you described is is the increased energy that's required for recovery based on the stimulus that you applied to the system and so this is one of the reasons why like you know high intensity work it doesn't necessarily always burn more calories than low end endurance work when it's happening or or for that quote unquote workout, but basically takes more energy to recover from higher intensity efforts. In terms of my understanding, th- there's a couple things. One, fat isn't very filling, it, and so it doesn't make us feel all that full, which can be good or bad. Two, fat has twice as many calories per gram, so it's energy dense in terms of carbohydrates and and protein. And then three, it's just physically really hard to eat like. 
8,000 calories of uh, just carbohydrates and protein. Protein is very filling and doesn't give us a lot of like usable energy. It's more of the building blocks that we need. So we we dial in protein, we get that set. You know, you can only store so much glycogen. Uh, and then it just becomes like, uh, how do I manage the caloric deficit here to make sure I just have enough energy? And so that that's kind of how we utilize it because it doesn't fill you up and it's really high in calories. And so a couple extra avocados, a couple handfuls of extra nuts, uh, nut butter, you know, juicy steak, a big piece of salmon, those things that have fat, they manage that caloric deficit when things are like really on the ground. Yeah. Keegan, have you noticed any like changes in cravings or hunger, like signals from your body when you've ramped up into these blocks like this that you do every week, not just occasionally and you do all the time? Sorry. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, exactly. uh, I don't know, it can be a bit tricky sometimes. Like it almost feels like eating is as much of a job as like work on the bike, you know? Like sometimes you you, know, you wake up on these big days, you're waking up at 5.30, 6, trying to ride by 7, 7.30. And you're trying to find that balance of breakfast of getting enough in, but that's not going to sit super heavy. So normally it's like something carb heavy, like you go pancakes or oats, or I've been eating some cream of rice stuff recently just to like have something different than just like globs of nut butter. But that's Kind of got to keep it pretty simple, something easy to eat and drench whatever it is in maple syrup to add the carb. carb. Yeah. And then when you're on the bike, I mean, obviously you're kind of just burning carbs. You know, you're trying to fit those down all day. And I mean, it's nice to have a little bit of real food, um, even if it's not real per se. Maybe it's ice cream <laughs> or uh, like a candy bar yeah. or something that's not a gel, you know, because sometimes you get back and you go straight to dinner. Yeah, make sure you're eating enough at dinner and then have you know, a quick snack before bed because bed comes quick when you're waking up at five or six. So yeah, it becomes... Yeah, and you've missed lunch yeah. throughout this whole period. And granted, like you're, like you said, you're taking in as much as you can. And for kilojoules, you're probably burning not too far off of like a thousand or, you know, probably like 850 up to like 1100 yeah. calories Yeah, I mean, hour. most of these rides are between five and 7,000 kjs, uh, depending on the yeah. day, like if there's efforts or not, or if it's just endurance. Uh, that changes a bit, you know, which is like two, that's, that's two and a half to all. I mean, we just times. generally, sorry, yeah. I was right, just going to say, Kyle, it's like yeah. two and a half to like four times the basal metabolic rate of like an average person, right? Like, yeah, like it's just, it's a huge amount. And, with, and with this other, with this added like time constraint, right? Yeah. Right. I remember reading one time, but before I knew what was going on, you know, I wasn't like doing nutrition for athletes at the time, but I remember reading one time what Michael Phelps's daily diet consisted of because he had a really high metabolism. He's very lean and swimming and biking are the two sports where you can have the most volume because the nature of the sport allows you to do massive volume. And it was just exhausting just listening to like what he had to eat in a day. You know, some people say, well, a calorie is a calorie. And, and if the furnace is burning hot enough, you can eat whatever you want. And, and I dis uh, fundamentally disagree with that. I think that you still need to be eating a healthy diet, even though, yes, you can eat ice cream uh, on a ride to break it up or other things at your gas station stop just at that point. But that's not the ma the majority of the, that's 500 calories out of 6,000 that you're trying to get down in a day. Just to put it into perspective, let's see, there's, there's 200 calories in one cup of rice. So just to get 2,000 calories of carbs in rice, you'd have to eat 10 cups of Which cooked is rice. I, I don't want to say it's impossible because Kobayashi, that hot dog eater guy, exists, yeah, yeah. But, like, <laughs> but I mean, effectively for most average people, that's, yeah. that's not going to be possible. Yeah. Like 10. Yeah. Classes. And so you have to supplement with, with fat, right? Cause fat isn't filling and, and fat will get you those calories. The other thing is, is the goal is not always to run totally even calories within the same 24 hour period. So if you have three days of really big volume or four days of really big volume, and then you have two or three days off, you can make up for it. Like you, you really can. You, you have to try and hit that protein goal each day. That's really important. But just from a caloric standpoint, it doesn't work on a breakfast, lunch, and dinner schedule. You know, I don't really think about those things at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. We typically, our day goes from like basically two meals before the workout and one meal after the workout is a day. Good, yeah, um, so irrespective of yeah, 24 kind of hours. hours. Exactly, yeah. And we sort of think about it more of like, all right, how much in the hole am I going this week? But what are my down days? And when can I try and make up for that? A lot of people have this sort of, we think about food as a reward for working out. And if you're an athlete, you can't think like that. 
you, you have to think about there are times where I'm going to be overeating on a down day because the next day is a big day and I'm going to be in a deficit. And the day after that, I'm quote unquote overeating, but I'm actually requiring that because I ran a deficit for this block or for this day or something like that. And so it's more of like, we're thinking about it in, in those terms, not as like a day by day transactional type thing. Yeah. Have you noticed that Keegan with like your recovery days, your body just being ravenous with hunger? Yeah. I mean, that's like the only way, <laughs> like you know, I also, that's the only way you can do it sometimes. Like if you have, you know, three or four big days in a row, like you're going to be in a deficit no matter how much you really try and eat because you just don't have the time, especially training here when you're riding in, you know, 90 to hundred degrees pretty much all day. Like, I mean, yesterday we took in, I probably took in 11 liters of fluid over that 10 hours on the bike and still get home feeling dehydrated. So then you're trying to hydrate yeah, and yeah. your stomach's full of water. And so you're also trying to eat and hydrate at the same time, which I found, actually found is like kind of tricky sometimes because you fill yourself up on water and hydration mix, whatever. But then you're also trying to get the food you need in. So you're like trying to find this balance of doing all that while still like getting that narrow window before you have to go back to sleep you know but yeah the hydration thing is crazy i didn't really put that together till after i was like wow we probably i drank about 11 liters and then not to mention like trying to drink a liter before leaving and then probably three liters yesterday after the ride to try and rehydrate before going to bed so you're like putting down so much fluid and that also becomes becomes a bit tricky of like trying to figure out I just, re- I remember Keegan, like breaking this down a little bit and correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like I'm remembering this correctly where it was almost like this come to Jesus moment where we were like, I think you're going to have to wear a camel back to you. Yeah. I don't know how else we're going to like, <laughs> and, and, and it was more of this like effort. I'm going to do it. Like, I can't believe I'm going to be on a gravel bike wearing a camel back, but there was no other solution that we could yeah. come up with to like, just cart that much fluid for some of these missions that are kind of out in the middle of nowhere where it's just like you're you you know some of the study there there's variability here and there's differences always but the the general working kind of math is that once you get below three percent of total body weight loss that's where you start seeing a lot of performance effects especially in a race environment where it's like full gas if you have an understanding roughly of about how much water how much fluid you lose per hour under different conditions we can sort of you know plan for that so if a person is losing one and a half liters per hour you can sort of calculate how much weight can i afford to lose in this ride and then what can i do and when you start talking about six to ten hour rides that math is just mind-blowing yeah like for a short and then, like you said, you get back and you take in this massive amount of like drink mix and fluid, right? And you're trying to match your salt sweatiness and all that stuff. And you're thinking about, okay, what's, what's training that's coming up? And then you have all this stomach distension, which contributes to feelings of fullness. And then you have to eat. And yeah, it's just like, there's a lot of hurdles yeah, here. It's a bit of a mission. I mean, for me, it took like, you know, the whole like carting around of this water. Like it took me figuring that out. For myself out here in the desert because I was like oh i can drink yeah 500 <laughs> mil an hour is totally fine and then just detonated so hard to, uh, probably three or four times before i was like all right fine you're gonna have to start just like drinking more water because if you don't you just like you can't do the work yeah and, and kyle I'm, I'm just like running some like loose math on what you talked about in terms of the percentage body weight that you would lose of total body weight yes. you know you can do that fast in warm conditions we're talking real for- fast most people listening to this is probably yeah. somewhere between like three to six pounds of, of weight. And yeah, so let's do, let's just do like if you take a 150 pound person and then, so that's 4.5 pounds, right? So like 30 minutes of that. Easy. Yeah. And that's the, that's exactly my point. It's, in, is it's that it happens crazy. way faster than people way think. Way faster. Like, so, so it's 2.2 pounds per liter. And, in hot conditions, you can easily lose two liters of sweat per hour. And so that's like the thing, you know, this is something that, that Keegan and I've worked on and, and I emphasize is like, it's from the first pedal stroke, your hydration and your feeding is going when you're training. There's this misconception that, well, I, I've read or I've heard that we have an hour of glycogen before we run out of glycogen. So. I don't need to eat until one hour. And it's like, you don't wait till the tank is empty before you start putting gas back in. You do it right away. Because the whole game is a game of catch up. And even if you're losing one and a half liters an hour and you're taking on a liter an hour, 
that's still a pound an hour, which is a 10 hour ride is a 10 pound deficit. Now, here's the thing is like, you can train yourself to a certain extent, like different people have different levels that they can, they can still perform with uh, varying levels of dehydration. And then the last part is just how hard it is, right? It's it's not that 2.9% body weight loss, everything is going great. And then at 3.1% body loss, the wheels are completely falling off and you're laying on the side of the road. There's always uh, ranges to this. And so it's more of like, that's just a general rule of thumb where like, if I aim for this, I can still be going kind of full gas as long as my feelings in place and my chances of blowing up are less but when a person blows up it's it's not like they stop riding completely they're just off the back and now they're just not going as hard as they would like to be going yeah and when a move goes they can't chase the move right and that's when yeah yeah it's all that variability within it and uh yeah yeah well this this is fascinating uh, to have you guys both here. It's cool to get some insight into this. Daryl submitted a question. I thought it was great to really have uh, you address here, Kyle. But with Keegan here, I think it's going to be fantastic too. Um, Daryl says, and he submitted this at trainerroad.com slash podcast. You can do that right now if you'd like. You can submit any training question you have. You can do it on Spotify too as well. He says, hey coaches, thanks for the five-star podcast and product. You've got my forever subscription. Thank you for that. And you can subscribe on any platform you want. On YouTube, we're darn close to eclipsing 100,000 subscribers. So uh, it's exciting times. Okay, next time you have Kyle on, could you walk through some hypothetical scenarios for how to prepare a nutrition plan for racing? Ideally, it would cover the principles and some hypothetical context for any changes week of, day before, and day of, then how to manage carbs, sodium, and hydration during the race. If you could do this for something short, like an hour long race and also something for plus four hours, that would be ideal. I want to p- put in that clip right now and say how much time we got partner, because we could go on this for a really long time. Uh, Kyle, really, I think that uh, the key things that are standing out for me here and Keegan, I'd really like be curious to see like how you change this up depending on the race differences, but maybe we can cover some principles, Kyle, on what you generally look to do or advise to do for athletes the week of, if there's anything different, Mm. or if it's merely a thing of day before is when you want to start changing up your nutrition. And then we can get into talking about what the changes are. This is not like, this is not mind blowing, but the, the thing that I'm surprised about is how little people train with their race, quote unquote, race day nutrition. So that's one of the first things I ask. Uh, I can't tell you the number of times, uh, particularly with younger athletes, uh, and I talk to them and I say, well, what are you thinking when you go into a workout? Like on a Tuesday, you know, you have a hard workout. And the response is usually like, I hope I have a good day. Like, I hope things go well today. But they have no idea what they did leading into that workout from a nutrition standpoint. Um, you know, they'll have an idea of how well they slept or that sort of thing. It's just more of like this, like mythical thing. Like, I hope it goes well. Right. The second thing is, is I say like, well, well, what do you typically eat? And they'll, they'll give me some description of what they do during the week. And I go, okay, well, walk me through what you do for a race. And it's totally different. And I was like, well, how do you usually feel for a race? And they're like, oh, I feel great. And it's like, well, then why don't you just do that? Like, there's nothing. It, it's this myth of magic food. There's no magical food that's making you race better. Just eat that for when you work out because you know you feel good when you're going hard and you're doing that. So the one thing I would say is that like, the more consistent you are with what you do during race week, the better. Because one, like magical food doesn't make you race faster. Quality training makes you race faster and consistency makes you race faster. And so what we want to do is install processes that are consistent and have consistent results so that now... Every day is like a quality day. And if it isn't, we actually can work backwards and you go, oh, yep, I missed carbs last night. I missed carbs yesterday at lunch. Oh, yeah, I messed up my sleep. There's like an explanation to it. It's not like, oh, that was awesome. I really had a good day. I wish I could bottle that feeling and just keep it. Like you can put in the processes to figure out what's in the bottle and then just do it. So there's actually not as many changes as you think in terms of that. We want to remove as many new variables because of the load, the the stress, the the kind of build up, the those types of things. I don't know. Maybe Keegan can talk to this. I think that was a change you made when you were a youngster. Like, and I'm not being what is that called when you're being parental, like parochial, par- 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 patriarchal. You know what I'm talking. 
Yeah. Patriarchal. Yeah, yeah, I'm not trying to do that. But yeah, I mean, it's this goes away is back. Yeah. Right? No, I mean, I think that was honestly one of the bigger things, you know, that you instilled in me to change. I mean, this is when we started working together, but it was like seven years ago or something now at this point. Um, yeah. And just like treating more like key workouts as as a race, you know, like you can't go into a workout under fueled and then you're God, like, oh, my legs just weren't good today. And then, you know, then the work you fail to work out and it's just like this, like endless cycle of like trying to figure out why it was bad. And now it's like, if I fail the workout, it's like, Oh, I didn't, I didn't eat enough last night or I didn't have a good enough breakfast or like normally it's because I missed the fueling. It's not because the engine wasn't running well. And it's like this going into race week thing, like you should have like pick a group ride or pick like a hard workout and treat that as your race and do that like your whole race protocol like two days out from that event or three days out so you can practice these things and get get in the routine and make sure they work you know you can't like you know let's say you eat oatmeal every day before training but then you're like oh i'm gonna race with pancakes and maybe like for a reason it just doesn't sit as well in your stomach and you didn't you didn't know this because you hadn't practiced it you know then just making sure you're getting enough carbs like the days leading into the race and before this key workout i think yep. everyone should have workouts that they're scared of you know i get workouts all the time you look at it and you're like oh man this is gonna blow my doors off i need to like treat this as is as if it's a race <laughs> you know make sure you carb load the day before make sure you're hydrated have like your nutrition planned out in terms of like i'm gonna have a gel every 40 minutes a gel every 30 minutes like whatever it is and you know back to the hydration thing as well you have your hydration plan and like treat this workout as if it were a race and that's going to set you up for success and then if you fail the workout it's all, you know it's all, all on you you have all the other boxes checked you know you're like okay well i probably need to dial the workout back or like maybe i'm overtrained or i'm just tired or whatever else but you shouldn't fail a workout because you weren't fueled well that's just like that's just on you you know so i guess that's like for me that's been a big thing that uh that kyle's helped me realize you know planning planning I mean, workouts it, in it, it does provide it does provide just a more objective analysis of like where you truly are from a fitness standpoint because right. not those other factors that absolutely impact performance it's just like it's there now it's not like oh well maybe i could have done this and then i would have done that or i would have you know it's just like no i did this and this is where i'm at and that gives you like very real objective data on how you can adjust training to like address those mm -hmm. things because you're not like amazing one day and then you suck a different day. And, and it's totally, you don't know if that's fitness. You don't know if that was nutrition. You don't know if that was like, you're trying to control those variables. So you get as an objective and realistic look, because especially when you're at a high level and you're looking for those margin, marginal gains, th there's no miracles in like high level sport. As much as we love those types of inspirational stories where like, you know, when, whenever someone comes out of nowhere, they are not coming out of nowhere. It, it has absolutely been a grind. And then all of a sudden they arrive and it's like, where'd this person come from? It's like, no, like look at someone like Haley Batten, who's just on fire this year, right? In the, in the UCR, that did not come from nowhere. <laughs> like that has been, but it seems like, oh, who's this? Like, it's not how it works. And so you, you want to stop from a race standpoint. You want to treat the race as a big deal because those are your goals. Those are your objectives. That's the thing. But your mind is going to do that for you already. What you want to do is from a practical and approach standpoint, you want it to kind of be quote unquote any other game. And then you, you let the different mental approach be the thing that gives you that extra off. But you want to minimize the surprises on that day because those are some of the things you actually can control. There's so many things you can't control in those types of environments. And like, well, let's try and dial these things in because I know I can control and it gives you a safe place to go when you're in the middle of those fights. It gives your brain. Uh, yeah, this is just like what we do on a regular basis when we're going this hard. It's just like there's this perception of a little bit higher stakes. And so and, and I'm not a sports psychologist. It's just what we've seen is if you can control those number of variables. So, you know, it's something that people are like, they kind of look for this big aha sort of thing around like, yeah, if I just do this special stuff on race day, that's what's going to put me over the top. And it's like, man, that special stuff has to become the norm in, throughout the day. Like you have to know, yeah, I got a big workout on Friday. I have a group workout this Saturday. I have the, what's the ride you do every weekend when you're in, in the Southwest? Yeah. Food out. So, uh, 
you know, and, and I'll ask them like, how's the shootout been going? Because that's like a real marker for what this is. And it's like, are we missing on this? Like, make sure that, you know, you take into account that the, the temperatures are going to be changing and start thinking about these things. It's the norm so that when you get to these races, you can just execute the pre race execution, you know, that the, the athletes have in their Apple notes and their, it's, it's like, here's the start time and we work backwards from there. It's very much like a normal day of training. Very much like a normal day of training. Yeah. That's the interesting thing that I'm getting from you, Kyle, and also from you, Keegan, on this is that traditionally there's a perspective that you eat in a way that is trying to keep you, quote, skinny. So you try to get by doing the bare minimum. And then when it comes to race time, this is the general idea. And then when it comes race week, it's like suddenly that goes out the window I'm going to gorge myself. I'm going to make sure I'm taking in a bunch of stuff. And just that delta from normal to suddenly this this race change that you've in, in implemented in race week, that introduces a huge amount of variables and inconsistency that will likely affect performance in ways that are unexpected. So instead, the perspective that I'm getting from you guys is that and especially for athletes listening to this, you're probably following a training plan of some sorts, whether it's a trainer road plan or whether it's something else, or at least you're training consistently. You probably have, like Keegan said, like workouts that spook you, you know, or group rides or something else. You probably have these opportunities or the, I guess these, these things where your body needs fuel. So it sounds like a more advocated approach for fueling the work consistently throughout the year when you're training, rather than just looking at race week as the time when you need to turn it up. Is that an accurate, uh, is that accurate representation? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think, I mean, there is definitely something to like, oh, it's a race week. You make sure you're like eating enough, like for a race, like unbound, for example, like you got to start that carb loading like days before, not just like the night yeah. before is like an XCO. You can just slam a bunch of carbs the night before and off you go. But I feel like unbound in these bigger gravel events or a marathon mountain bike race, like sometimes it's like a multi-day process. So there is like something to that, like, oh, you have to like start putting more food down, but you also shouldn't change things drastically. And maybe like also maybe pay a little more attention to what you're eating. Like, oh, I'm not going to go out and eat like you're not going to eat sushi like a day before the race, right? Like the risk of like getting sick or whatever else. Like you want to keep it a little more simple, less maybe you're not going to eat as much salad or like filling greens like because you have more room you can fit more carbs if you don't eat as much fibrous vegetables i guess but otherwise like your yeah. general diet yeah. shouldn't be like drastically different yeah let's talk about that specific point there the loading portion of it like kyle mm. you work with like you mentioned we've got Haley batten who's racing xco and her i don't work are, with Haley. i oh, just you don't work i just Haley. observe so, yeah sorry like you've uh, worked with you've worked she, with kate in the yeah, past yeah, yeah, though yeah, yeah. and yeah. and they're they're doing 30 minute to 90 minute races primarily. Yeah. And then you've yeah. got runners that are doing things in, in yeah. my words, at least entirely too fast, the pace at which yeah. you can run those <laughs> races. So really short. And then we've got, you know, Keegan doing really big, long stuff. So how do you judge like when to start a carb load? Are there principles that people can follow with that? So not, so not every, I'm just going to put this out there. Not everyone can agree with my approach on this or, or like what my thoughts are on this. And there, there's a little, it's a hard thing to study. There's individual variability and stuff like that. Based on my kind of analysis and, and my approach, even for shorter distances, I would rather someone be carb loaded because based on what we've seen and based on some of the evidence in terms of like where fatigue comes from and, and central nervous system signaling and stuff like that, the, the way I kind of put it is like you're, you're, you're sort of, your body's keeping track, your brain is keeping track of what's in the system and how fast you're going through it. And so there can be some advantages, even when you, when your conscious brain knows you're only running an 800, there, there's some advantages to, um, you know, potentially being a little more fueled up than what was just required for that, for example. And so, um, you, the other thing you can think of, and, and this is going to vary greatly on different individuals and their training status and things like that, but just the like total amount of carbohydrates that you can onboard. So let's say I just guess, I don't know, Keegan can onboard 500 grams of carbohydrates, right? Between his glycogen stores and different things like that. So you kind of work backwards from that based on his ability to eat. But in the same time, he's sleeping every night, which depletes your liver glycogen and he's moving around during the day. So like you're not doing nothing leading into a race, but you're trying to get fully fueled. And so you just do some maths based on the individual and based on the event to try and work backwards from the event to make sure you have the amount of carbs that you know works for you 
Um, but that's usually not a one meal thing. And then you're also going, okay, I'm going in here with like a fully loaded system, but this is going to be a a 10 hour race, a 12 hour race, a 24 hour race, a four hour race, so whatever. And so I need to have a plan once I start tapping into those stores, you know, you work hard to, but then you're immediately spending that cash right away. And we, we kind of want your system to, to kind of always know that you have the money to spend, like you, you have the bank account, you have the balance that, that you can spend. And I think that's really helpful to kind of think of it in those terms. So, yeah, I don't know. One of my favorite like lines, you get savings that. account almost, right? Yeah. Like, it's like those sorts of like things that we can understand, right? You want that, you want that money available. Um, but you have to have it built up. One of my favorite lines that, that Keegan had was after the, it was one of your first big endurance events. It, it was like a, was it a fall or an early spring 24 hour race? What oh, was yeah, I did the, that was a 24 hour solo. And we, we, we got on the phone to debrief after that. And he was like, dude, that, that was as much of an eating contest as it was a bike race. <laughs> like it was, uh, it's just like, that's the way you have to approach some of these things, especially when you're going at the intensities that people are going for the time that they're going. Like you kind of have to have a plan and it can't just be, I'm just going to do this for race day. Right. Cause then your stomach's yeah. not trained for it. You're. You don't know what your stomach can handle. You don't know what it can do under different situations. You don't have your gas station plan. You don't have your yell plan. Like you can't do that stuff on the fly. Kyle, do you have foods that you encourage people to stay away from when they're carb loading? Or I think he can now nutrients. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you want to be looking at things that you can kind of absorb easily and get into the system as opposed to things that are really kind of heavy and fibrous and and that sort of thing. So you kind of want to think about that. And it's also obviously like we've talked about the disconnect between like general healthy eating and eating for performance and that eating for performance is not always healthy for like in the, in a general way, but it also doesn't mean it's unhealthy within the context of performance. So it's a little bit convoluted. Uh, like you might have to go back through and listen to that a couple of times, but it, it does make sense. What I said does make sense. And so we're not, we're not eating unhealthy in a manner that puts the athlete in any long term health risk, right? We would never do anything to like compromise long term health for short term performance gains, but it doesn't mean that it's healthy under different circumstances. And so you kind of have to find a balance of those changes. And and I think what Keegan said is really important. Like maybe you just have a simulation of you do a race simulation, but but it's not just that day. Like if you know you're going to simulate your race on you know X Saturday, you work back from that two weeks. And if you're doing a full simulation, it's got to be the whole process. It can't just be that day. If that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. This is mm-hmm. uh, we often. To and to really appeal to the folks that are listening to this that are hyper data driven, they want to know how many grams per kilogram that they need to take in of carbs, how many grams per kilogram of protein, and how many grams per kilogram of fat. And they're just like, give me that, I'll color by numbers, and that's what I want, yeah. right? And that's yeah. like kind of how they stick by it. Um, and and I don't know if you have any of those because what I'm hearing from you, Kyle, is and it, it really, it's like, if you're experimenting with this consistently, you're going to find what works best for you. And it's not oh, as yeah. easy as, and it's not as easy yeah. as just saying you need to take in 10 or 12 grams per kilogram of carbohydrate. And if you're doing that, then you're going to be carb loaded and you can check the box. Instead, it sounds like shoot high and do it often and work your way up to it. So you can figure it out. Is that, and sorry, Keegan, I don't oh, know if you want to. No, I was just saying, sometimes it's almost like, I mean, I'm carb loading for races. I don't really pay that much attention to the actual numbers. That's kind of just, you eat as much as you can until you're almost uncomfortable. You know, when it comes to like, it's just straight, it's not like I'm putting down that much protein and fat. It's like, sure, there is a little bit of protein and fat in those pre-race meals, but the majority of it is just like white rice or pasta. And you kind of just eat until you can't eat that much more. And then when it goes away and you feel like you can't eat more, then you try and put a little more in the tank. Um, I think it just like, it, so it gets like hard for me. Like there's so much other stuff going on. I'm worrying about the race and like tactics and this and that to have like, I need to eat like hundred grams of carbs for this meal and 50 grams here. Just like add for me, it would add too much stress. So it's really just like, just slam as much carbs as you can and 
um, normally it works out, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, if there is like this, there is, it, it, so these are the, this is highlights the different approaches, right? This is like what makes doing this with, with this level of athlete super fun. Cause you're like, well, you, you know, someone say, well, what does Keegan do? And it's like, well, he just eats whatever he, <laughs> like, he just gets it in. Right. But other people want to know because they need to flip that switch off that says, yeah, I know I do well with 400 grams of carbs in the, in the four meals before a race. And so I want to check that box and that, that makes a difference to me. So then fine, you, you do that. So it really is like, uh, man, it's, it's really hard to give a bunch of people these very general answers without just sort of pointing them in the, in the, the general directions. What I would say, and, and you even see this like in the textbook, literally the textbook, like the, the sports nutrition textbook I teach out of at EOU says, uh, athletes should get, uh, three grams per kilogram body weight of carbohydrate to nine grams of kilogram per carbohydrate so so, body weight, right? A massive and, potential increase. Three to nine is a yeah, huge range. So, so it's a huge range, right? And if you're, if you're 70 kg and you're getting nine, that's 630 grams of, of white rice in a day. Like that's a lot of food to try and get in, in, in a 24 hour period while you're also trying to get you know, the one, 1. 1.6 grams per kilogram body weight of protein and one to 1. 1.2 grams per kilogram body weight of fat. And this is where like, you know, but, it, and then you compare that to what the RDA recommendation is. The RDA recommendation for carbs per day for an adult is 130 grams. And that's just, it's not, it doesn't change for the size of the person. It doesn't change for anything. They just said, you know what, between 120, and 130 grams is what our brain needs. And for recreationally active individuals, they can get a little bit of fuel from that and fuel the majority of their fuel from fat. And that's going to be good enough for them and put them in a position to kind of like have what is their version of a healthy body weight. And we typically get a lot more than 120 grams of carbs per day. We typically get quite a bit less than 700 grams of carbs per day. So mm -hmm. it's, it's like, uh, but again, like you, you can, especially if you kind of trust your body and you know your body and you work well with that and like counting it and thinking about it and overanalyzing it be a source of stress, then you take this, the approach Keegan. If it's something that you need because you're that type of person, then yep, I can do it. And, and, and it's the same as working with an athlete that's like, like, um, I'm a robot. I don't, I don't get a lot of pleasure from food. Um, like I'll eat the same thing every single day if you tell me that. And I actually have to work for those people to say like, no, no, we need more variety because food is just more than the the things you think it's being made up of. Right. So we need to get more out of this where like there's people that could do that every day and never have to worry about it. And then um, there's other people that like food has to be fun to me. Food has to have meaning to me. Food has to have variety and sometimes I kind of have to put my foot down in terms of reining that back in and saying, if we want the data that we want, we have to normalize this a little bit more in a way that we can objectively analyze it. And so it, it, I just keep going back to this, but it's, it's not, I'm not ducking the question. It's just, it just freaking depends. Like it's all there is to it. Yeah. During the race, and we've covered this, so Daryl, I'm going to refer you back to the previous podcast that we did with Kyle, where we talked about like the high oxidation rates that we're seeing from really high athletes or assumed high oxidation rates, but what we are seeing is higher income rates in terms of what they're actually yeah. ingesting. And it's all over the place. I just saw Sam Long, who's having a heck of a year, like so like super impressive in the triathlon side of things. And we just saw, I think the other day, I might be wrong on this and I know I've heard that Sam has listened. Maybe, I don't know, but uh, maybe if you are listening, maybe you can correct us on this, but I heard it was 180 grams per hour that they took in on the bike. Um, and, and, you know, for triathlon and stuff, that sort of thing that might, you kind of make sense to take in. You can't obviously take some in on the swim unless you're me and you're choking down so many gallons of water. You're bound to get a carb somewhere in there. Uh, <laughs> but for most people that are like cyclists, algae like, carb. Yeah, exactly. Algae carbs. Um, we hope they're algae and that's it. But for, you know, for triathletes, they're just getting it on 
you know, that they're getting it on the, the buy. That's the buffet, yeah. right? And that's when they can yeah. take it in because on the run it's tough. But yeah. I'll just forward you, Daryl, to that one because we talked all about the limitations possibly that exist in terms of how much we can take in or process and and what it's at. And in the end, I think it is pretty darn variable. Like well, from individual. Like if someone's stomach, right? if someone's stomach can actually handle 180 grams of carbohydrates while they're exercising intensely, even on a bike, that's just a tower. That's all there is to it. Like there's, <laughs> yeah, like just like uh, what do the kids say? He's built different. Yeah. Sam is built <laughs> so different. Like, yeah, he's just Sam has built he's built different, different right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he is. Yeah, yeah, it's it's awesome, and, and like you, you can train yourself to a certain extent, right? But at some point, you can just like, yeah. I mean, Keegan's like this to a certain extent where. I remember when Goo came out, I think he alerted me to this, where Goo came out with a with a cake icing. Yeah, birthday flavor, cake. Birthday oh. cake flavor of a gel. And he was like, these things are amazing. I can eat them all day. I can eat them. And I think I just could not imagine eating more than one of these out of like experimentation. Like, <laughs> and I definitely couldn't eat it like while I was exercising hard. And I think that's all you ate when you ever yeah. said during COVID. Probably had like 30 was of them. birthday cake booze. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Oh <laughs> and, and I was like, do you get like, do you want me to research other products? Do you get tired of this? Or you get, and he goes, no, man, I love it. Like I could just eat every, he's like, you tell me to eat more. I will eat more of them because they are amazing. You know, the bike is just, like, like, it's just easy. It tastes, it tastes half decent. And it's full of carbs. You know, like the never second stuff. I have like orange citrus berry on the bike. You just like, just give me, just give me the sugar. It all, it's all good. Like, give me all. Yeah, like, your training yeah. times, you can, you can taste some little, little differences. But, well, the never second was a game changer because you're getting yeah. like almost ten grams more. Yeah, you get 30, 30 grams total, which is uh, pretty sweet. Uh, and the taste, this is awesome. And they're just a good company. They're a little like, thinner viscosity they're, they're too. Cool. Like they don't feel like they dehydrate you. Like mm-hmm. you can take them, and then you don't need to immediately chase it with water, which is extremely nice so you can eat it and then it's also sounds like carrying is like backup hydration almost if you lose a bottle or i can just i can suck down a gel and it'll get me to i can't believe where it needs to be i still can't believe i haven't tried their their gels but is it similar to like a science and sport yeah. gel where it's really yeah it's um, pretty, science and sport gel is like downright watery probably yeah it's um, probably yeah. similar to that actually you know, i'm not sure if i had had an sis but uh yeah the the new orange one is really good and the passion fruit are my probably my two favorites um, and the new berry caffeine is quite nice because before the caffeine was just cola and espresso. So it's nice to have a, I don't know, it's not as bitter, I guess. Really? It's more, yeah, you don't really, it goes down easy. Man, and they have a sweet. freezable gel, which is brilliant yeah. because like the, I mean, if you want to cool yourself off, there's a ton of different ways you can try to do it from no, the frozen outside. gels are 90 to 100 are very sick. Day. They're a little hard logistically to nail. Like you have to have. Like someone has to have a cooler or a freezer and you have to like get it cut off mm-hmm. because it's basically like an otter pot. Like it's like, I don't know, it's a little taller than normal gel, a little thicker, but it doesn't, it freezes like into like a slushy consistency. Um, but they're pretty sweet. When we were, when we were first that's, got those last year. That's so smart. Cause yeah, like it's such a good yeah, idea. We t- to test it yeah. like Sophia would drive out, meet me somewhere with the gels. Like, all right, we can slam them down here. Cause otherwise you can't, you can't carry them and you have to like, figure out it's like kind of hard logistically to do it but they're they're sweet they cool you off really well at a nice yeah Yeah. so and it's like the the studies show that the the slushy type consistency there's something to it that's different than just cold water or or ice like it's that slurry yeah they do a good job it's good i think the first time we really went hard on that was um was it the white rim one uh, was that, uh, it might have been FKT. unbound because the FKT, we were just focusing on, uh, just trying to get the carbs. Like that was a hydration thing, the so. car, but no, no, not, not for the ice, just for when we were like, it was like so much never said. Yeah. And, <laughs> and it was just like, and it's like playing nice with the stomach and it's doing these things. So anyways, yeah. like it's, yeah, it's a smart choice. Um, so yeah, and then uh, I hope that Daryl, you got some of your or you got you got your answers there. And if you didn't get all of them, you can listen to the prior episode with Kyle, and you'll you can piece it all together, and you'll get like fantastic uh, one there. This next one is from Vera. I don't know if we'll be able to cover the whole thing. I'm looking at the time that we have right now, Kyle. Uh, 
Are we good for like the that. next like the yeah, yeah, yeah we're yeah, good. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um yeah, and Keegan, we we're we're good too. So um cool, awesome. All right, rejoice for recovery days. Vera says, I'm hoping you could guide me on supplement choices. I come from a bodybuilding background with a focus on physique, then transferred to CrossFit. And wouldn't you know it? Now I do triathlon. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Way to go, Vera. You've been through all a ton of it. Um Vera says, I've taken such a wide variety of supplements over the years, and even though I knew some of them likely weren't having an effect, I chose to lean into the placebo effect. Even if I didn't get a health benefit from them, I firmly believe they helped me as if I was leaving no stone unturned during, in the pursuit of my goals. And therefore, I found them useful. That's a really interesting point. And we can just like talk on this really quick before we get into more of the question, but that's a real thing, right, Kyle? In the sense that- yeah. Like you might take these, these, you know, whatever it's a vitamin or a supplement, and it might be the equivalent of taking something like a placebo pill, an actual, like, you know, a, just a sugar based pill or like, you know, a, a stevia pill or something. But if it makes you feel like you're dialed and you're, you're doing absolutely everything, that's going to put you in a headspace to be able to succeed. Yeah. So placebo effect is real. Like that's, that's kind of, I'm not an expert in, this research and the people that research the impact of placebos is like some of the coolest human research that I've come across because like just fundamentally, how do you have a control group when placebo is your experimental group? It's really interesting. Like, Ooh, yeah. so you, you basically need like, it like blows my mind every time. It's yeah, like how do you do that? It, where it's like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so, and there's some like really smart people that have done some very elegant studies on this to, to demonstrate the, the impact of the, the other thing about that is that, yeah, I mean, I think that it, it depends on, again, it depends on the individual if they feel dialed when they do that, you know, other people, um, feel like, they have a story in their head that like supplements aren't natural. And so it's actually this thing that like they, they don't want to do it. There is some like emotion and, and sort of feelings towards supplements and different people come from, I'm, I'm pretty a emotional. And so I just kind of look at it from a very pragmatic standpoint. So I can't really speak to the placebo. So if I was talking to Vera, I wouldn't be like, no, that's, or yes, that's absolutely what's going right. on. I would just, it would be more of like, yeah, as long as we're not, we know we're not doing anything that's going to put you at risk. Um, that's kind of where I would start that conversation. Like this is, this is what some of the long-term studies have shown with this. This is what the benefits may be. And if they're not, you feel dialed when you do these things and you check these boxes and let's keep doing it. Um, yeah. so it's, it's actually not just like a set supplement program that's like okay you here you get this sheet and it's all these supplements like i literally had an athlete one time oh, i've actually talked about this publicly and so is he so you might know who nixon is he, he was a 800 meter mm -hmm. runner and and oh yeah i think he he went to several olympics and silver world championships one year he's a really good runner did not like taking supplements and as he was like towards the end of his career he he joined our our track team and we still like he won another american title he he qualified for a world championship he did these things um that where you usually have a pretty small window of performance in track and and he sort of realized that yeah some of the stuff we were doing probably does work so he just set a limit he goes i'll take five things you rank them and decide what you, yeah. what you want to do but that was his like hard line right where other times people are just like I'll take it. I'll do anything. If we think it's going to be, if it's legal and we think it's going to work, like let's, let's get it done. And so it, it, again, it just really depends on, on what that does for you. Yeah. The one just fundamental thing that I'll say about supplements though, is like, they have to be just that. That's like my line around supplements. They have to be supplemental. They can't be, they have to be supplemental to a good diet. Like it's in the freaking name. And this is, this goes, this Gym goes bros all the way. using their minds right now. <laughs> it, it goes all the way down to uh, like when I teach 200 level general nutrition and we, we talk about like the role of multivitamins, which is actually pretty complicated because they're, it's hard to tell whether multivitamins do anything or don't. Um, but what I'll, what I'll get, like, I'll get a diet analysis assignment back and someone will say, well, you know, I was really low on this and I was really low on that. 
but it's cool because I take a multivitamin. And like, that's not, the multivitamin has to be the insurance policy, not the plan. And so the supplement has to be supplemental. And so if you're, if your overall diet and your overall fueling isn't dialed, there's no magic things that you can take. And then the next kind of step up from that are like, where is the majority of the evidence for like the ones we absolutely know work and are safe? So for example, the way we've been talking about carbohydrates in, in these podcasts and, and like in the context of Keegan's, um, writing, for example, th- these are not like carbohydrates as part of a well balanced diet. These are carbohydrates that are being used as supplements. supplements. We often don't think of it like that. Let, that's like, I'll have conversations with people and be like, well, how do I count up my calories on the bike? And it's more like, yeah, we want to be aware of those different types of things, but the, what you're taking on in the bike is supplemental. What I'm concerned about is your diet because those carbs are being used as a supplement and carbs are, are performance enhancing supplement. Um, and so, uh, caffeine is another one, right? That, that's very well established that, that has these things. And then, and then it gets more subtler and subtler and you start asking yourself like, one, is this safe? Why am I taking it? And is it going to contribute to a marginal gain that I really want and need? And so it gets, as the list grows, the likely impact is less, but at a very high level, there's usually very small margins. Um, how long is that race, Keegan, the one in Kansas? Uh, on about 10 hours. Yeah, but how in the last two years, it's come down to a sprint finish? Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's like not, that's not cool. Like, I think that's not cool. <laughs> like, and so like, you know, and it's like, what's this little thing going to do for me? And it's like, well, how important is, you know, those last eight pedal strokes in a 10 hour race? Right. Like that's, that's not, so, it's such a good point, Kyle, right? Like you, you know, it's, we're, we're talking about like margins that are so extremely thin, like the difference Keegan between you and then second place last year. I don't know if it was Vakoch. Yeah, it was Vakoch. It was year, like Peter, maybe half a bike. Yeah. So now take that over 10 hours and look at the time it's difference. Like, <laughs> like, like nothing. you know, the, the hair has been split to the atomic level. Like it's just, yeah. Uh, the differences are so small. And with something like a supplement, so like to your point, Kyle, like you're saying, we know that there are certain ones like like carbohydrates, like caffeine, that absolutely improve performance. And that well, those ones, the research is solid, empirical evidence is solid. People can go experiment and see that very obviously, right? Whereas there's so many other ones that aren't like that. However, on the off chance that they are having a positive effect, and assuming that they aren't having a negative effect, it's, and then assuming that it's well, within budget. It's, it's right? not assuming. So like there are certain things that we know like just definitely don't have a negative effect. But the overwhelming evidence to support a positive effect is not as strong as like you would like. And you take a couple things into consideration. One, like you can't find N equals 50... Keegan's and Kate's to study the impact of this. Um, two, the average is very like people don't typically respond to the average number. So if you say when you eat this many carbohydrates or you get or you do this other thing, people on average improved by 10%. Well, if you try that, uh, you, you know, your friend is going to increase by 15% and you're going to go down by 5%. And now the average is 10%. Mm-hmm. But you, so people don't normally respond to the average. The average is more of just like a statistic to give us, you, you don't use the average as this is what I expect to get. You use the average to say, okay, the average response is convincing enough to give this a try and see how I respond individually. And so as you're looking at that research, if, if the physiologic plausibility is there, if the average is there, if the study design is well done, if multiple groups have shown similar responses under multiple conditions and multiple settings, then all of a sudden, like, you may not have this super convincing meta analytic data, but you have enough data to go like, I think we should try this and see how you respond to it. But again, 
it, it, it really like, you don't want to spend that money and those resources and that time of effort unless you know that that could be the difference. Um, yes. and, and so you, you have to kind of weigh those things. And that's where having like, you know, we're talking very openly here. I'm not worried about someone getting a competitive advantage over Keegan because it's such a individualized thing. We're talking about things generally, if that makes sense. That's why like yeah. having your own personal plan and your own personal approach is only for you. And, and like it's, we, we can talk openly about that sort of thing in an environment like this without, yeah. um, yeah, with, without compromising some sort of like even a placebo perceived competitive advantage because it's just doesn't matter because everyone's going to respond differently to those things. I don't know. What do you think about that, Keegan? Yeah. I mean, I just do what you tell me. To be honest, I don't really have an opinion <laughs> on, <laughs> on, uh, like on, uh, supplements. I mean, I think easiest client ever. Like, I think they're like, you know, I wouldn't take them if I wasn't racing, I guess. I wasn't really wanting to be competitive and have every edge because it's like, I don't really think you need it unless you're like anemic and you need iron or like you're low in vitamin D and you go, you know, the doctor tells you you need to take vitamin D. But like in terms of like the exercise performance side of it, like I think it's something that like you really only really need to take if it's like you're looking for every edge and every bit to be a bit faster and you have someone like a professional telling you and helping guide you and what to take. Like, I'm not going to go like pound a bunch of creatine or some random supplements because it's, you know, someone said it was better. It's like, I'm only doing like taking things that I know, like Kyle has like proven research on that. I know are safe that aren't going to test positive somewhere. And then, then, then there's a whole like finding that supplement in a brand that's trusted and that's like tested and not, uh, just some random something off the shelf. Even if it's the same product, it might come from a different factory or whatever. So like, there's a lot of, lot of factors there so like i just i don't love supplements like i don't like you know don't just take them because i think oh i should take this because it makes me better it's like oh, i take this because kyle says it does this and there's a reason and this brand is is safe like it's tested and it's like like it should you know obviously there's always a, probably a very small minuscule chance but like you know there's also you could eat some bad beef or whatever as they always claim but uh sure yeah i think that's that's my take on it you know i don't think I, you don't just want to go take things randomly like haphazardly i think you want to have like some sort of guidance whether it's from a doctor or a dietitian or you know whatever um yeah and it's extremely unique for an athlete the like keegan's level and profile where they are tested regularly and uh, as a result they are constantly at risk of a positive test if they are taking in supplements of unknown origins or of high pro or I should say like that aren't low probability of, of, of causing some sort of an infraction with rules. Cause this is the interesting thing too, Kyle, in the sense that not all supplements are controlled under the same, they, they don't all operate by this, like caffeine, for example, uh, it is not well controlled in terms of where it comes from, like, you know, no dose or something over the counter versus getting it from some other product. It's not like it's always the same coming from the same facility, following the same guidelines. And as a result, you don't know what you'll get in it. So it's a bit more risky in that regard. You're hoping that something like, you know, caffeine is going to be controlled when it comes from a brand that's it's inside a nutrition product, then it's a trusted brand. But not all supplements are created equal. So you certainly have to like, and they don't all abide by the same rules and regulations. So that's, that's like, there is an inherent risk to that. But for most people listening to this, you probably aren't getting tested by WADA and woken up at 6 a.m. for them asking you to pee in a cup. And you don't have to get tested after you race. You probably don't have to worry about that stuff. So I want to make sure that like what Keegan just mentioned there, it's understandable because of his context. For all of us listening to this, if you are racing, you still need to abide by the same rules if you're uh, competing in sanctioned racing. But we probably don't have this. Your career isn't going to end because you took a supplement that came from a factory that was tainted with something else. And that's like a a very real career risk that Keegan has where most of us probably don't have I to guess, worry as much. Yeah, we still want to like... I uh, all right, I was just going to say, I guess too, like I'd argue that you still probably want to have take supplements that are tested like, because yeah. there might be something that it's not just that's, that's not good to have or it's just a complete waste of money like there's actually yeah. like none of the product they say that's in there whereas if it's tested at least there probably is the product they say that's in there annually you know and you know it's safe so i think 
there's just no reason like just spend the extra five dollars and get the one that is better or ten dollars. Otherwise, there's no reason to spend the money anyway. I guess that's especially if you're making that right. Game. If you're gonna take it, like yeah. do it right. So this sounds like that's what you're yeah. Spend. So there's a couple. Yeah, it's it's similar. So there's two things that I think are are important. The first is that one you do like I was. It was really enlightening for me when I started doing this and getting a lot of questions from athletes and different things like this and and looking into the testing protocols and the different companies and the different. And when we started uh, a long time ago, there weren't as many like actually tested, you know, third party tested. And so we had to kind of search for those labels and look at that. And then you find, um, you know, some of these certifications are very real. Like the, the, the batches are tested. The facilities are third party tested. There, there's like some real authentication that is required to get to those things. And then there's sort of minimum levels of authentication and then there's different. So, um, and now it's like testing in and of itself has become an industry, uh, because of the number of people that say, um, you know, people want to be able to take the things that they want to take, but they want to do it in this safe way. And also companies want to produce products and not be thrown under the bus if, if they, um, cause they don't want their product that, that's their livelihood getting blamed for something. So that they, so it's, it's like this whole thing that's getting better and better as it goes along. One of the caveats of that are, or the, the, I, I don't know if it's downside. But one of the caveats of that is that companies may market their supplement as being useful because it's tested. So mm-hmm. Informed Choice, Informed Spore, NSF for Spore, GMP, USP, like these are ways that companies uh, use to market their the quality of their products. And it it gives the suggestion that the product is useful because it's been tested. And that's not necessarily the case. So you want to make sure that the product is what it is, uh, or, or that the, the product that you're using is the thing that you're trying to use and you're using it for a specific reason. Then you go find the certified version of that that's in the dosing and in the quality and all the stuff that you want. The last thing is, is that, you, you know, a lot of the research on supplements are using they're trying to isolate the effect of that individual supplement. And so they look at it in isolation. But what happens then is a lot of products will um, then combine a bunch of things that have research behind them. So, So the person thinks they're getting what they need to get because the names are the same, but they're not getting the right dose. And if they get the right dose, they've now thrown off the doses of all the other things that are in that kind of more complicated product. And so proprietary those blends, are, right, Kyle? Yeah, like, proprietary blends, right? You wanna you wanna kind of be and even when it's not a proprietary blend, but it's just a multi, it's a really complicated formula, it typically checks all these boxes. But oftentimes the thing that you say, Oh yeah, I'm glad it has that, I'm glad it has that. There's usually not like one supplement that has the right amount of everything for your body size, for your type, for your sport, those types of things. So you kind of want to keep those things in mind. Um, the, the funniest one is I use this again. I've used all these teaching examples. Uh, but uh, like a couple of years ago, these, these energy drinks called bang got really popular at college campuses. So I don't, I don't see them as often now, but so it was like a flash in the pan sort of thing. And they're, they would say, oh, we have this and we have that. But the, the one that I remember is one of the, one of the kids was drinking it and it, it was being, it had like creatine written all over it. Like it was being marketed as creatine and creatine for what it does can be like a really effective supplement under certain circumstances, but it requires like a loading, like an on ramp protocol. Um, most research suggests like 20 grams a day for seven days in a row. And then a three to five grams per day maintenance. Well, so, so, and, and that it's not effective for probably the first couple of weeks that you're taking it. And then you have to maintain it as you're taking it and you, you sort of use it for very specific reason. So, so that seven days of 20,000 milligrams of creatine just to get you to a point where 5,000 milligrams per day 
is what you need basically indefinitely to reap the benefits of it. And they were marketing it as being this, like, has all this creatine in it. And I think I had 250 milligrams of creatine that they just, like, <laughs> sprinkled into it so they could market it like that. Yeah. So <laughs> it's it's those types of things you have to think about. And and I think that, again, if if um, the simplest answer is usually the, the most obvious answer, and that's usually the one that's right for most people... And uh, as you get more and more complicated or more and more, you need more input and more thought to be put into it and stuff like that. It's like, it's sort of like, how do you become a better runner? You just run more, right? But at some point you can't run more. You have to start doing certain types of workouts and stuff like that. But the solution for most people is to just run more or, yeah. you know, how do I feel better with my nutrition? Eat better. Um, yeah. If we get that taken care of for two years and everything's going, but now we've hit some sort of wall that we think it can be solved by this or that, then yeah. you start implementing those other things. Yeah. With with this discussion, we've effectively answered Vera's question, but there's an interesting detail mm-hmm. to it here that I want to cover, Kyle, because mm-hmm. – um, yeah, I'll, I'll just read through. So more or less, we've kind of discussed like on supplements and the principles behind it about how to go about them, finding if you have individual benefit, all that stuff. If it's placebo, and or if you don't know if it's placebo or not, if it's benefit, it's benefit. Uh, making sure it comes from a safe place, making sure that you're looking at the research behind it. But here's what she says. She says, after discovering your podcast, I found confidence in looking into research and discovering if products actually perform according to the marketing claims. This has been really helpful for me and my bank account, she says, <laughs> but after finding so much conflicting or disproving research, now I'm wondering if I should just forget supplements altogether. Yeah. And this is like the the point that I wanted to cover, Kyle, though. The, the yeah. thing is, if you look into research behind this stuff, um, yeah. good research is, go- is always going to be objective. And, and as a result, it's an objective test of some specific thing. Yeah. So not every... Not every research and like endeavor is going to mm-hmm. point out a specific thing that is going to deliver the benefit that you will have, right? Because I could find this. Like if you look at any topic that has a lot of research on it, it's very rare that it's all purely conclusive that indeed this yeah, is better a hundred percent. It's the way to go. Yeah. So Kyle, do you have any like recommendations for weeding through on this? Like when research seems to be conflicting or discouraging or just mm-hmm. dis- like cause disillusion. What what do you recommend for people? Or maybe it's how to interpret the research perhaps a bit better. So at the risk of sounding sort of gate gatekeepy, um, this is where experience and expertise can be really beneficial because there there's an art to applying these things. And and there there's even art in researching them. And then there's also just things you've learned through conversations with people and training and teaching and these different types of things where you you sort of have these little alarm bells that that are sort of when you're reading a paper or you're hearing a certain thing or you sort of see a th- thing and i am not these are my opinions this is my evaluation of the things these are my approaches i think that's really really important this is not a you know i have an advanced degree so i'm going to tell everybody like what to think that that's not my approach at all it's very this is just my own journey and so i reserve the right then to make interpretations based off of the information that i'm seeing and have critical discussions and sometimes those are academic in nature and a lot of times those are applied in nature so if i'm talking to other researchers and things and this is what they're seeing I take that that information into account. But if I'm talking to athletes, like th- the researchers don't always know everything. Athletes are having this like experience and that experience is their own and we can take that in. And then like you don't always like, I, I learn a lot from Keegan, for example, but I don't treat anyone else just like Keegan because Keegan is an N of one. And But I can take things out of it and say, oh, you know what? Like I had this other athlete that, like to eat this at the 17th hour of a 24 hour race let's try that and see if it works for you so that's like what i call the art of it and and it becomes like what what vera is describing does make you want to just throw your hands up and say i'm wondering if this is just all just for not if you're if you're doing that research to like evolve your approach and your craft and it's something that you enjoy then i would say keep doing that and 
you know, you can kind of try some of these things out in a safe way if, if you know it's safe for you and it's legal and these different types of things. If it is a cause of like stress and you're trying to get to some finish line where like, I just need to get to this point and then I'll know everything I need to know about supplements. Like it's just going to be constant frustration and you will just want to like throw your hands up. And, and so somebody might be better off saying like, yeah, I tried to do that for a while. The finish line kept moving on me. And so I got out of it. Or you could get into it and say, yeah, I know there's a lot of subtlety here and there's a lot of individual responsiveness and there's a lot of back and forth and there's probably not one right answer. And then the third, the third kind of, but, but I accept that and I still am enjoying this process. And then the third kind of version of this is you can find whatever answer you're looking for with the amount of information that's available to you right now. So if I just decide that like, I want all my athletes on creatine, I could build an argument around it, right? And yeah. just, I can ignore what I don't, what, what isn't convenient for that argument. And I can build it around whatever I want. And then, and then anecdotally, I'll just, I'll just take the, athletes that responded well and say, see, I have all these people that turn their careers around because they started doing this thing. And I'll just sort of ignore the people that are, were non-responders. And so torture the data long enough and it'll tell you whatever you want. Yeah. It'll tell you what you want. Right. And it's not even, that's not a, there's a big discussion about this in the academic community about this thing called P hacking, where you're it's so important to get positive results that you sort of look at your data until you get positive results. But the the other part of that is if you're like so strict that you're unwilling to look at things in a variety of different ways, then you might miss something that's super interesting. And so there's never going to be just this one thing. And and uh, it's if if that stresses you out, then just like stop doing that to yourself <laughs> because yeah. there's no finish line. For that, but if it's sort of like, oh, I want to. This is why it's really difficult to, you know. Right now, I'm reading um, Bruce Lee's daughter's book. I think it's called something like Fl- "Flow Like Water" or "Be Like Water" or something like that. Super, super interesting and insightful. And there's like this this whole thing about putting your thoughts on the internet, putting your thoughts in published papers, putting your thoughts in books, on a and podcast. like <laughs> saying it on a podcast and making that concrete. <laughs> And it's like, yeah, but you said that at one time. Like, I reserve the right to evolve. And, and like this. And so I'm always like overemphasizing this is where I'm at currently in my journey based on my experience. This is what I think. Um, yeah. It's and to approach it. If you're not willing to start, if you don't like to be in those, in that water, then you kind of have to like just stop causing yourself stress and yeah, eat healthy and stop taking supplements. But if you're, but if you're sort of like, oh, I want to try this, or I want to think about that, or I want to do this, or I like the placebo effect of it, or I like that, then make sure you're doing it safely and that it is based off some like reasonable physiologic plausibility. And then when you discuss it, make sure that you're discussing it in terms of this is what I did, this is how it worked or didn't work for me, and this is why I kept doing it or stopped doing it personally. Yeah. Um, and when we share that type of information, then it empowers people to make their own decision. Yeah. From the outside in, I see people looking for studies to be final because in many, in final evidence of something and, uh, almost like a, like a points battle where we're looking at like racking up there, you know, and, um, and studies are often used as slam dunks in modern discourse Mm -hmm. in the sense that like, well, here's my position and here's a study. So mic drop, I'm out. And, and these are I, researchers from put in your Ivy League school or your yes, big school or yes. your, put, you put in the publication record and then that's it. It's yeah. just the way it is. And yeah. as a result, I see a lot of people from the outside in, uh, and, and I am no expert in going through research. I do it often. I find it fun. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I find it enjoyable, but I don't have an educational background. I'm not. I haven't gone through any sort of certification process in my life to go through any of that. And I've really had to learn how to understand the context of a topic and where whatever I'm reading fits into that context. And I think that that's like a, instead of looking for dunks, you you kind of look for things and every little thing is a piece of evidence that stands upon its own with its own set of unique circumstances. And some, in some cases, like something like creatine over time, it becomes so prevalent that it does indeed 
help in certain ways with different things that it's like, yeah, okay, it's safe to say that this is a likely outcome of this. So this is exactly the point I was just about to jump in and make, which is that like science takes time. Like like the way it was described to me by one of my mentors who is like the, the, one of the smartest people I've ever met in my life. He He's amazing. And he, um, he, he, he was like, you know, the whole thing is based on this, like, like building the whole, like science, science in the most ideal setting is a pursuit for truth, the active pursuit for the truth. And when you get a little shred of that or a little piece of that, it's a brick that, that then you put into the structure and that brick has to be firm. It has to be what the person, but in, in each one of those things is like a little brick. And, and if the brick, if the bricks or the building is built on a shaky foundation, it doesn't withstand, that. but it takes a lot of time to build up that structure in a way that, yeah, we, we finally get to the point where that structure is stable. And that's the thing is like one or two studies, like I'll mark them and go like, yeah, this is interesting, but I need like, the I need this follow up study and this question and this question and the cool thing about the scientific community is there's people thinking the same way and then there's you just need a couple people to act on it that have the funding mm-hmm. that have the resources that have that they act on it and then you take that information you put it all in the context and you go like yeah I've been keeping my eye on this and it's finally bearing out it it like the original studies from the original group that had the original hypothesis. Now it's bearing out in these different conditions. And that's, again, it's, it's hard. If, if you're not trained in a specific way, it can be hard to take in that amount of information and sort of, have it. and again, I'm influenced by my mentors. I'm influenced by my process. I'm influenced by my experience with athletes. And, but that's what makes science cool. There's a lot of really good people doing mm-hmm. similar things to what I do that, that like, you know, if an athlete doesn't find success with me and finds it with a different person, like that's the whole point of it is like, we're just trying to get people to their potential. And, and like, like that doesn't always go through, you know, the, it doesn't always go through one, one road. And so, yeah. Yeah. Um, the other thing I would say is that just you want to be like healthy skeptical. I, I meet people that are like too skeptical where they just say, Oh, this is crazy. This is, this is too far out there. This is too far beyond what I learned in school. This is too far. And then that, that response just dial it back to like, I'm going to see how this plays out. I'm going to follow this story for the next couple of years and see how it plays out and see if it's safe and see if it's working and see if other people are implementing it. And then there's the other side of it where you just get way too overexcited about every new study that comes out. And there's just too many to keep up with, right? If I, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, when you, and then you factor in things like wearables and you do all these other different types of things and you're tasting this fab and you're only hearing from responders yeah. and, yeah, it's it's a messy kind of world. Like, hopefully, this is making it better and not less, but yeah. not less messy. But um, yeah, I mean, I see opportunities like this as part of like my community service because I have a unique skill set, and so I I like having the opportunity to to be able to talk about it in this way. Yeah, but I don't, I can't shy away from how complicated and muddy it is. Um, my my like fourth nutrition idol, who I've never met happily. Uh, is a woman from Australia named Louise Burke, and her yeah. her writing, her approach, her willingness to question, her ability to connect with athletes and researchers and students, her the tone at which she writes, her openness and and but healthy skepticism. These are all the things that like, if there's someone that's like in this world that I'm aspiring towards, it's it's kind of her model. Um, that's cool. The last, last thing that I'll say on this, cause I just have it. You can tell I've, I've been in my, like, whatever. So, um, the last, last thing about this is that the issue with research when it comes to sports performance is that research for sports performance is not well funded because nobody cares about like giving public resources to making fast people faster. Maybe it, that's just the reality of it, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. NIH, <laughs> I'm not getting an NIH grant to like see how we can get Keegan a little bit faster. 
it, it, like worthwhile could be interesting it, it, yeah it could be interesting <laughs> right but you're not yeah. like so so a lot of like especially in 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 america we don't put a lot of like public resources or, or government resources into sports research or sports performance research a lot of that comes from like independent funding and and student funding and and uh or like grants that you can get to work with students to give them some experience and it comes from small like company grants and those types of things to to like and then you're asking these questions that we all want to know the answers to but that's where a lot of this and the reason why a lot of like uh sports performance research comes out of europe and in australia and new zealand particularly is because they have institutes of sport that are supported and will give grants for these specific purposes and so mm -hmm. that's why you get people like your louise burke who can say well i kept hearing from athletes all the time that drinking coca-cola was amazing and i just thought that can't be it's just sugar and this and that but when but we did the study i heard her talk about this in one of her talks and she was like then we did the studies and yeah there was like they liked Coke better. Like they performed better when they were drinking flat Coke. And, and I thought, well, who am I to say this isn't like, you have to look at the data. And so we don't like a lot of people that, that would do really good studies aren't studying performance. Yeah, that makes sense. And I wanted to add while you're saying that, uh, researchers, if you have a topic that you want to address that involves the realm of sports performance, so like improving performance, particularly with cyclists, uh, reach out to us. We're a bootstrapped company. We do not have a big marketing budget. Okay. So it's not like we're like some, like the bank of, of, uh, of research that you can go to here, but we have funded studies partially in the past. Um, they don't have anything to do with trainer road. And we would be happy to support, we feel it's like one of our duties. Uh, we have this obsession with making the world faster and, and we really would like those opportunities if they come up. So feel free to reach out to us, um, and, and let us know because funding is a barrier barrier for sure to get that done. It is. I'll, I'll close with Kyle, like a great example of what you said. Um, just last week on the podcast we were, and it's, it's, uh, or just a couple of weeks ago, there's a study that was really interesting. It was actually an athlete submitted a question and asked if apple cider vinegar was going to help them lose weight. Mm. And I was like, well, this is a crazy homeopath, you know, that naturopath thing. I'm going to ignore this one. We're not going to cover it. And then, uh, thanks to Eric Trexler, Trexler and the mass research review that he puts out, I was listening to that. And he was, uh, he was talking about apple cider vinegar. I was like, Oh geez, I got to look into this now. <laughs> and we looked so, into it and there's this interesting study and we covered this whole thing. And sure enough, based off of that, I looked into the forum and a bunch of people were like, I found apple cider vinegar for cheap. It's over here. And people are just jumping in. And we were covering that study and talking about the fact that it's really important that people understand that one study is not conclusive evidence of some sort of outcome that will happen for you. Instead, there there's a lot of things that can't be noted in terms of the context for subjects and all that other stuff. And it's really tough. So yeah, Vera, yeah. Um, don't feel discouraged if you do like yeah, looking yeah, through yeah. research, like Kyle said. Keep going through. You just have to make sure your grains of salt are handy. And, and it's, have the right it's meant to be messy. Sorry, it I cut you off. Be, has to be. Sorry. No, it's no, absolutely true. It has yeah. to be. It's right? meant because to be messy. if it was too perfectly clean and comprehensive, it would probably not be accurate, right? Yeah. Like, like it has to be. So, I actually had uh, one of my colleagues told me one time, if if someone, when they're describing nutrition research, or something in regards to nutrition. If they say something with absolute confidence, they either don't know what they're talking about or they're trying to sell you something. And like mm -hmm. it's a and it's it's an interesting um you have to just build in and accept that variability. And if you like it, keep diving in. And if you don't like that process, then um you know, general recommendations are just that for a reason. They they capture 98% of the curve. What we're trying to do is figure out like where you are on the curve and how we can use that for, for, you know, different things. And it's super fun process. So yeah, yeah it just depends on, on what your approach is. Sorry, Keegan, we, we got into it there. As it goes. I was just going to say, I don't want to, I don't want to record the next bit, but I actually have a study and a supplement that I want to talk to you two about in, in particular, but I don't feel it'd be responsible to talk about it because it's just one study and I don't want to yeah. cause people going out and buying like apple cider vinegar, what happened here. Also, because yeah. if it works really well, Maybe uh, you guys. I'm not sure Keegan wants the world to know about it yet. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. Anyways, this has been a good episode. <laughs> Thanks a bunch, Kyle. Yeah, Thanks cool. Keegan. No, if it's my pleasure, man. 
Yeah, if you appreciated this episode, uh, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. That would be hugely helpful, but also share the podcast with your friends. That's how we grow. Uh, we do not have a big marketing budget. Um, I'm the marketing budget. So uh, <laughs> so we really appreciate what you guys do uh, to be able to keep Trainer Row going and, and keep us growing. We have some really exciting stuff coming up. Um, we've had some really cool meetings lately and some really exciting things and learning some cool stuff. So uh, sign up for Trainer Road. Go do it right now on trainerroad.com and we'll talk to you all next week. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thanks. Thanks, y'all.